I'm Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephen Toop, uh, the uh, director of the Monk School of Global Affairs. And on behalf of the law school and the Monk School, I'd like to welcome you back for uh, this afternoon's continuation of uh, what has already been a very uh, engaging uh, set of discussions around effects uh, after the attacks in Paris. Uh, this afternoon, we're beginning uh, with uh, what I know is going to be a really uh, fascinating discussion uh, because of the participants. Uh, I will say that uh, you have a program, so we're not introducing everyone. Uh, they're very distinguished. Uh, and we're going to focus on uh, an analysis of uh, media in terms of responses to the Paris attacks and, I guess, implicitly what the role of the media is, and it's called from headlines to analysis. I'd like to welcome uh, the chair, Brian Stewart, who's a senior fellow here at the Monk School. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, very much indeed. Um, I was struck by the fascinating uh, sessions before this, that the word need for context, of course, kept coming up. But also, as the discussion neared the, the break, more and more one was hearing lines like, it is hard not to be pessimistic. We're not good at taking time. We've got an impatience problem in the 21st century. Context, impatience, pessimism, perfect setup for a media discussion. Uh, and I want to give my own a little bit of context first. Uh, when I graduated, which was only nine months after the Kennedy assassination, it was into a very different world than today. And it's very hard to get across to people now how really since 9-11, the media, along with all other institutions and along with governments, has been cast into this vortex of ever speeding up crises and events and 24-7 events that had to be responded to. Not just good enough now to have the headlines, you have to have frequently the immediate analysis. Um, so we're really, in fact, Doug and I were talking uh, just before this, that we remember the summer before 9-11, when basically, I remember at the CBC desk, I complained that the news business was basically going to die. It was going to go out of business because nothing big was happening anymore in the world. Or crises were coming at us so few, there really wasn't that much to do. Um, but we did, we, we are in a position now, and this is the context, that the media itself is under a great deal of stress due to events, due to the fragmentation of the media, due to ever more strengthened finances, and itself is dealing, as are all other institutions uh, now, with a lot of analysis of whether we're doing a decent job or whether we could do, do much better. And as other panels have agreed that uh, each guest here has asked one opening question to be asked of them, which they can answer up to two minutes. So before we start our conversation, I'll just say, Doug Saunders, I would like you to answer the question. When you sat watching the crisis develop, writing about it, and consuming the news, was there ever a point when you said, hey, wait a minute, this is exactly not how I see the situation <laughs> developing. Something's really wrong in this coverage. Well, yes, um, though not while the attacks in Paris were taking place. And I've, I wasn't there for that. I've, I've, I've been in Paris for other recent attacks, including the, uh, the uh, attack on the, uh, on the uh, uh, Jewish nursery school and so on in uh, 2012 and so on. So uh, uh, I know how these things unfold. Um, and uh, I thought the actual coverage of the event itself and, and even of the immediate French political aftermath was pretty robust and, and sophisticated and, and didn't reach for simple things. I think the problems occurred with the discrepancy between the actual world out there and what was being said occurred when media outlets began looking for a larger narrative to tie these attacks to, particularly a larger narrative in Europe. What does this say about Europe right now? And I think we run into problems when that happens, when you start trying to use a, you know, a metonymy or a synecdoche or whatever you call it to, 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 to be the thing that symbolizes the entire region or culture or people. Um, and the two examples of that I'd point to were first there was a, there's always a, a media desire to look for a story about a backlash against something that's just happened. Surely there's going to be uh, a backlash against Muslims was, was what I'm sure every newsroom said, and people went out looking for it. Um, 
And I think the thing that people latched onto was a group based in Dresden, Germany called Pegida, which called itself Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamization of the West, which had some protest marches in the city of Dresden. Uh, and we started seeing stories across the North American media saying that Germany has been overtaken with anti-Muslim, anti-religious minority politics. Uh, the, the intolerant right is back again in Germany, and sweeping across Europe soon became a headline that was related to that too. This was linked to other similar movements in other countries that in response to the Charlie Hebdo attacks were sweeping across Europe. And by the time people noticed that this was a municipal phenomenon that was confined to Dresden and not even much of Dresden, um, that narrative had already been out there. In fact, it turned out Pegida, yes, was, was part of a sort of tradition of little racist crank groups in smaller cities of the former East Germany in, in Saxony and Brandenburg uh, that have never been able to gain more than sort of municipal council seats and that faded out probably about two days after its leader was shown in a photograph wearing a Hitler mustache, which, which luckily today in Germany makes, makes somebody persona non grata pretty much instantly still. Uh, and miss the point, the larger point, that that backlash politics really didn't happen very much this time in Europe. The, the anti-religious minority and anti-immigrant parties of the right have become sort of third-place parties in many countries, but have not risen above that level in any country. In fact, they've not become the official opposition or the government. In fact, it's an extraordinary accomplishment in the, in the, seven, the years since the 2008 economic crisis, the worst crisis that Europe's seen in six or seven decades. Not a single extremist party has become a government or even an official opposition anywhere and so on. And even in France, where 17% of French voters are willing to vote for a party in the first round of the presidential vote that, that's opposed to Jews and Muslims and, and Roma, uh, they saw no, they were on a, the Front National was unable to capitalize on this event either, in good part because uh, Marine Le Pen, the leader of the party, is, was the main target of Charlie Hebdo. They portrayed her on the cover as a concentration camp guard and so on. So, so they were unable to, so that was the one narrative that was wrong. The, the other one, was the flip side of that, rather than looking for a backlash, looking for a forelash, as you might call it, uh, to try to say that this attack was evidence that, that the entire Muslim population of Europe, or a large part of it, was becoming radicalized in this way. And of course, I think we all saw this, that uh, Fox News in the United States was forced to apologize for having run several stories claiming that European cities contained no-go zones, areas where Sharia law prevailed and where the police and ambulances dared not go and where women could not walk uh, and so on. Um, but that was not just Fox News. A whole lot of media outlets retailed that claim, which had been floating in the air, sort of came out of right-wing blogs by people who'd paid one visit to Europe 15 years ago or something, that, that in East London or in Malmo, Sweden, or in Brussels, there was some district that had been so taken over by religious extremists that nobody dared go there. There's always some place that, that the reader was unlikely to have gone. Of course, there are poor immigrant neighborhoods that have crime and have drug problems and things like this, but, but there was nothing of, uh, of that magnitude to be found. Their apology, I think, helped a bit, particularly because they'd singled out Birmingham, England, which, uh, which was a lot of people did know and was so far removed from the reality that was being portrayed that way. But th again, once the apology had occurred, that was out there. This, the, the, we have both this idea that Europe was being overtaken by Islamic extremists in its domestic neighborhoods and that Europe was being overtaken by, uh, by far-right organizations opposed to those religious minorities that you think a civil war was occurring on the continent. And in fact, the reality is much more subtle and, and needed examination on a point-by-point -point case rather than trying to find these sweeping narratives. Okay. Natasha, did you, what did you find that was well done by the media? And you're, you were observing this from CBC television news. Uh, and what, what, what did not live up to your expectations or angered you? Well, before I answer that, I, I do think there were things that the media got right, things media got wrong and then things that we need to work on as collective media. But because my main responsibility at CBC News is as a breaking news reporter, I just wanted to inform folks here that 
It's an odd coincidence that earlier today during our morning sessions, a French police arrested four more people in connection with the Paris attacks. So one person is a man who seems to have some connection to Koulibaly, the man who killed the French police officer and also held folks hostage in that Jewish um, supermarket. That man is connected to him in some capacity. His girlfriend has been arrested, who is a policewoman. And then the other two individuals at this point, they haven't given many details. But there's no way I can be a breaking news reporter and not share that information with you, particularly since we're having this discussion today. So to get back to your question, what I think we got right in the media is that we gave it a lot of attention. And we, you know, we've been talking about that a lot. Did we overemphasize the importance of that attack, those gruesome images, those... I'm sorry, horrible, monstrous men screaming in the streets their warped ideology of Islam. I think we gave it the attention it deserved. This was a major, major political story that deserved to be on the front page of every newspaper. It deserved the amount of coverage that it got. And I think for the most part, news organizations covered it responsibly, ethically. They did not fear monger. They did not blow things out of proportion for the most part. So I think we got that right. Where I think we went wrong was the response, and I know hopefully we'll get into this in greater detail, but there's no way to talk about how the media covered this without talking about the cartoons themselves. And for the most part, English media in this country, including CBC, where I work, did, chose not to publish the cartoons that had been previously published. They chose not to publish the cover of the Charlie Hebdo the week after the attacks, and um, it, our French colleagues did, and I applaud them for that. The National Post did, Sun News Network did, and I applaud them sincerely because I think they absolutely made the right decision in my mind, and I can certainly understand why certain managers and leaders of news organizations might have chosen to not do so, but I think it was wrong, and I think it was wrong journalistically, and I think it was wrong philosophically, and I think it was wrong as a Muslim. And where I think we need to do some work is on the analysis end of it. So we covered the news well, we got the facts right, we got the story and the information out there appropriately. But when we had to delve into analyzing it and breaking the story down and figuring out why, which is so hard and which is the essence of the work, how could something like this happen? How in 2015 could something so horrid happen? And it, for it to continue over the course of the week and for there to be such a sense of chaos and disruption in the civility of our life, and I do mean all of us, because it's not just France, it's, it's an assault on all of us, I sincerely feel. Um, I, th I think we're strong on challenging political figures, but we were not strong in challenging representatives of potentially Islamist um, ideology. And so what I mean by that is, this is something I can say, because I'm a Muslim, because I was born in Pakistan and I grew up in Saudi Arabia, and I'm a practicing Muslim, but we are soft on this issue. As an institution, the media is soft on this, and it's understandable. You don't want to be Islamophobic. You don't want to come across as racist. We have a great tradition of protecting minorities, particularly in this country, of being tolerant, of trying to understand, but where it's gone too far is that we see Muslims only as victims. And so we don't hold leadership in Muslim communities accountable the way we do political leaders. And to some degree, the leader of an imam or an is Islamic group is a political leader, particularly if they are espousing political ideologies. If they are proponents of Sharia law or other political ideologies that are linked and rooted in Islam, then we have to hold them accountable in the same way every political interview on television in a newspaper is an accountability interview. Every interview with a leader of an Islamic group needs to be an accountability interview. I spoke to Brian about this in the week following the attacks because we want to understand, and we as media want to understand what are Muslims thinking, what are they feeling. So we interview folks, and they come on air, and I saw this twice on two different networks, including the one I work for. A leader of a mosque came on and said, well, as long as the West keeps uh, assaulting our people, things like this are going to happen. Attacks on Charlie Hebdo will continue. And that's it. Interview over. Thank you for coming. Ask the follow-up. And I, I sincerely think that the media needs to feel that they have the permission to be a bit tougher on this. This is a matter of accountability. It's not a matter of racism. It's not a matter of Islamophobia. Does your mosque, does your group 
purport, does it push a certain ideology that is counter to the laws of this country? And if so, you have a responsibility to challenge it. Thanks. I'm going to hold the Charlie Hebdo discussion a little bit later because I want to just deal with the ongoing journalism problem. But you do open a, a very interesting door that one has to go through. In the immediate aftermath of the attacks, I watched uh, Al Jazeera English, and they had one Islamic speaker after another come forward, very much strongly condemning the attacks, very, very uh, blistering, actually, responses. And they had not one, but two, the three, four, dozens seem to come on over the hours. You look at Canadian television, and, and even more American, you might get one Arab clip. I wonder if the point is that we're not just being soft, we're kind of lazy. We, should, we could be getting more sources out there from that community if we were prepared to deal with the, the things you mentioned, the embarrassment, the difficulty finding them, and the commitment to put them on air. So this is a legitimate concern. We need to get the voices out there. But we all know, and for those who don't know, if you're a reporter and you've got the deadline, You've got to make deadlines. So I need a Muslim voice. Well, where's the easiest place to go to get that Muslim voice? I'm going to run over to the local mosque, interview the imam because he's there, and he claims that he's the authority on how Muslims feel on this, and his job is to be Muslim all day long. So, okay, great. That's my voice. But that man, and it is always a man, represents a very small faction of what it means to be Muslim. One of our um, panelists earlier today said, and thank you for saying it, is that most Muslims are not busy being Muslims. Most of us are trying to pay our mortgages, go to our nine-to-five jobs, put our kids through school. We've got the same concern. So that secular voice or that moderate middle road voice, that same voice that's as confused as any mainstream Canadian, is left out because they're not, they're not accessible. It takes a lot of work. I, I do think there's an element of laziness in it because you have to get the deadline, the work done by the deadline. So you go to the easiest place you can go. Um, and frankly, they don't look Muslim enough because, well, you don't have a beard and you're not wearing a hijab and you don't, you don't fit. There is an element of racism in this. You don't look like the kind of Muslim I want featured in my story. So I don't know if you're authentic enough. Doug, does this concern you just as well? Because yeah. you've written some very insightful articles about how we, we misconstrue the level of anguish in, in Islamic communities, certainly in Europe, uh, very often. But uh, what, what about this lack of getting uh, a serious response from the community? The idea of, look, I think you're quite right, the finding of representatives is always going to be a very difficult thing. Um, because the people who say they represent a community or, or a religion or so on, um, they represent their own followers. And it's, it's always a bit dangerous to get an authority from within a community to represent it. On the other hand, finding a random person on the street is 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 uh, is going to run into problems. Also, I I think I think there part of it is a lack of understanding of the division between uh, situation faced by a community of religious believers uh, in an area and the political movement known as Islamism, that exists within some members of that community, but is also sort of preying on them, uh, and that sort of thing. And the relationship between political beliefs and religious, religious beliefs, probably because there are religious leaders who have extreme political beliefs. Um, mosques are a particularly tricky thing in Europe because, and I think it's to some extent in Canada as well, in, in the sense that uh, you quickly learn when you're there that uh, the imams at mosques in Europe are overwhelmingly non-European-born people who have been shipped in from Saudi Arabia or Egypt for the simple reason that those are the only places that will, and Turkey to quite some extent these days as well, uh, those are the only places that will pay the salaries of an imam. There's not really a tithing system in the same sense, and it's a community that's fairly poor anyway. So they get these guys shipped in from, from Saudi Arabia or Egypt, which, which finance imams and pay their salaries all over all over Europe, and not only they usually don't even speak the same language as their community around them, and are coming from a completely different place. To a lesser extent, I think that's a problem in Canada as well. The idea of finding representatives this way is very, is very tricky. I would I would I would say um, there's a terrible journalistic instinct to find 
to look up the organization of X, whichever group you've just seen, and assume that their spokesperson is speaking for them and so on. I've, I've often joked that if something terrible happened in the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, community that, uh, that the WASP Council of Canada would be founded. I'd, I'd be alarmed at how they'd speak for me. They're, I think they're located over there at Massey College, in <laughs> fact, and, uh, and, and I'm not sure if I would feel very comfortable with how they represented me. Dealing with then the, the problem, to come back to original concern and the concern of the panelists before us of things happening so fast, it's things happening to a degree where we uh, we, we simply don't have the same control over anymore. And um, there have been studies done that the more uncertain society feels, the faster and faster information comes in, the more pont this pontificating analysis is spewed out, the more often there are going to be a lot of mistakes. And is there a sense that this the sheer brilliance of crisis coverage that we can now do in newspapers and on television, radio, in fact puts more and more pressure on that spinning wheel to go faster and faster, which puts more and more pressure on the governments to move faster and faster, which leads people into perhaps a, a quicker acceptance of a need for a security clampdown. Governments all have this, this, this need to seize the narrative. They have to get hold of a narrative before anyone else. And governments will come out after every crisis and say, we need to re-examine re our security apparatus and see how it's functioning, which can usually be translated, we'll be back shortly, very shortly, with some tougher security laws. But is there a problem now that our sheer brilliance of the immediacy of our coverage, if I can use that term, is dangerously, if I could use that term, affecting our society's willingness to act too quickly, to bring measures, security crackdown measures too fast? Or am I being completely paranoid in this? I don't know. I, I, it's difficult for, I think, us as reporters to respond to that because our primary responsibility is to get the story out there as quickly as possible, as correctly as we possibly can. So, but it's not just the government reacting because the first thing we do is call defade and call the prime minister's office and say, what's your response to this attack that's happened? What's your response to this statement that's been put out by this Islamic organization? So I think one thing is feeding into the next. And so then the government puts out a response that might be interpreted by some of us as an overreaction. And so then we... Uh, report it, and then we put the analysis out there that, oh, they're they're hyping this up and they're making it a bigger deal than it actually is. It's I feel like a machine that feeds into itself, but I think we have to get the story out there. And just as an exercise, so the last time I worked was on Friday, and just to give you a sense of over the course of my eight-hour shift, the stories that we covered and the lack of analysis about what we're seeing being covered. So I'm working for CBC News Network. If you take out sports and weather, this is the news that the 11 stories we covered. Zihaf Bebo, a Winnipeg dad named John, is concerned that his son has become radicalized and has gone over to fight with ISIS. ISIS destroys the ancient city of Nimrud. Brookings Institute puts out uh, analysis on Twitter uh, being used by ISIS. A Montreal mosque facing charges that it's illegally using its space. Concordia University's MSA, which is the Muslim Students Association Library, is uh, having to account for radical materials in the library. Then four other stories that are not some way interlinked with Islam, Muslims, radicalization of, of young people in this country. So for me, the concern is that all of these are being reported individually, and that's fine. Of course, they are independent individual stories, but imagine if the six stories were conservative politician in Alberta, Prime Minister Harper, the spouse of a conservative politician. If we made, instead of it being Muslim conservative politicians, there would be outrage. This would be the headline, what the hell is happening in the conservative party? throughout the country. And so that same type of analysis, we are not allowing ourselves permission to have I, when it comes to this. Natasha and I were talking earlier about that sort of sense of guilt that you feel as a reporter when, when you cover a major crime story, which I don't do much these days. I'm a columnist and editor of columnists, but, uh, uh, but I've certainly done plenty in the past. And you know it's going to be at the top of page A1. And you know, certainly sitting here in Toronto, that we are living in a country with one of the lowest crime rates, 
Uh, we are living in a, the city with, I think Toronto has the 37th highest crime rate of any Canadian city, and I don't think I could name 36 Canadian cities. Uh, and we are living in a city, in a country with the lowest crime rate that has the lowest crime rate in about 60 years. And it's been following pretty much consistently for, for even longer than that. Um, and that by putting that gruesome crime on the top of page A1, you're going to create a perception among readers who tend to see follow the world by looking at the dots and joining the dots, and we're putting another dot on the page, which says there's a lot of crime and you should be scared, and you should support policies that, that uh, work against that fear and politics that work against that fear. I don't know the solution to that, because I actually think gruesome crimes are of interest, and in, in, I'm interested in covering it, but there's a, certainly that's, uh, that's also true of things like Islamic extremism and so on, which are phenomena in Canada. I don't besmirch anyone covering that guy from Ottawa who went off and joined ISIS, uh, that guy from Calgary who went off and joined ISIS, uh, the various terrorist plots that have emerged from people who may or may not sympathize with these groups and so on. But I do know that pointillistically we're creating this notion that there's a flood of Canadians going and joining ISIS or Islamic State, um, when in fact of the foreigners who go join them, something like 1% or 2% are coming from Canada and the United States combined or something, and, and, and it's fairly negligible. We're also creating a perception that Muslim communities in Canada are marginal and radical and religiously extreme. Those are three very different things that are generally unrelated, whereas, in fact, they are middle class, very prosperous, not very religious, uh, and uh, and have a higher university rate than average, average Canadians and so on, and that they're only uh, three or four percent of the population and not growing very fast, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, so th there's this worry that crisis coverage is glorious, it's wonderful to do, it's the one time we always get it right and people love us when there's a big crisis and, and read us and watch us and so on, knowing that our, that crisis coverage, as, as grand as it feels, is is putting another dot on that dot to dot. And the counter to that is also true. So when you do the, the crisis coverage of an Islamist attack or Muslims going over, co converts from the West going over to fight with ISIS, and then we talk about Islamophobia. So for the one, and we do it big, like if there's been an act of Islamophobia, a woman in Montreal has been told, take off your hijab in the courtroom, we blow that up too. And overwhelmingly Muslims in the West feel safe in the West. And they study after study shows that they while they might disagree with the political agenda or the West's response to certain Islamist um, ideologies, they feel an allegiance to the countries that they're living in, that they've immigrated to. So while it's true that we don't want to blow Islamism out of proportion, we also don't want to blow uh, Islamophobia out of proportion. Overwhelmingly, Muslims in the West feel safer in the West than they might in the countries of their ethnic origin. One of the things, though, too, we all have to live with a faster world and challenges come us much faster. In the media coverage of the aftermath, which one of the debates is, of course, over security, Bill 51, uh, I think we do a good job of seeking out very good experts in this area to discuss, and there's been some excellent articles in, uh, in the media and appearances in the media. One area, though, that I think there's been a, a weakness and uh, it's, a, it's a worry, is that we're not very good at process stories, or at least reporters aren't very good at being able to sell them to the editors. And I used to have enormous problem doing this. It's process stories are those stories that try and explain, even in the midst of a crisis, how things really work. If we're having a debate over Bill 51, you want to know, what is a sunset clause, and why is it sort of really important to have that? Or what is oversight of our security agencies? We, we don't do the mechanisms of Parliament very well. We don't do depth coverage of uh, basically policies as well as we probably should. We do hunger for the clash in question period, The what is the verbal combat wherever you see it. And I think it's lost along the way here, and I think this, kind of, this society and other societies would benefit more if the media, if it can't slow down, at least it went into somewhat greater depth in discussing policies and that, where they are very important to multiculturalism, to national security, and into our international obligations as well. Sometimes the process stories tell the whole story, uh, but I, I mean, this is a flaw of my own as well. Sometimes that opening up the hood and showing how the engine works type of journalism is exactly what you need, and it's, it's 
I remember a classic example. I was in Germany a couple years after September 11th attacks, and I'd wanted to look into how they missed this Al Qaeda cell in Hamburg that that carried out the attacks uh, when it was sitting there in a in an apartment by the train station for three years. Uh, and uh, the process story there <laughs> was that, because uh, it had come out that their intelligence agency had given uh, the Church of Scientology about 10 times more prominence than Al Qaeda. It, it, it had been the big threat that they had seen. And then you realize when you got there that, well, yes, it depends what you mean by their intelligence agency. Because Germany has 17 intelligence agencies, one for each of the 16 launder or states, and one national one, all of whom hate each other and don't speak to each other or share information and so on. And that was a big part of the reason why these guys tended to move around and, and that sort of thing. Um, and that institutional story got lost in a lot of the sort of Sturm and Drang uh, of the coverage. There was some stuff like that on the American institutions which all hated each other and didn't speak to each other and, and therefore uh, uh, missed all this as well. I think we're going to have a story, unfortunately, years later about the Canadian, Canadian security and policing institutions that all hate each other and don't speak to each other and are going to be asked to carry out a law which, among other things, uh, makes the holding of certain ideas illegal. Uh, and that we're going to learn much too late about the institutional problems with these organizations that aren't being discussed as we're simply looking at the headline items about the laws. I think there has been some mention of the idea of civilian oversight uh, that batted around in the House of Commons without a lot of discussion of the huge, severe dysfunction with, within the organizations that are being asked to carry out these laws. One of the things, too, I, I noticed that there, there is a, a somewhat of a lack when we bring up the question of debate over new security measures in this country. We do so assuming the basis that we are a society with a uniquely clean, clear record, a really good liberal society. And I think the historical record is often overlooked in this country. The, the horrible abuses that occurred in Canada during the First and Second World War, the detentions of assumed aliens, the uh, Red Scare of the 1950s, and uh, God knows what a story I covered, the uh, Quebec Crisis and the War Measures Act, the arrests of 478 people, almost all of them completely innocent. These things have occurred in Canada, but they don't get mentioned too much as, or dare I forget, the great RCMP affair uh, and the, the, the stripping of the RCMP of its security service because it couldn't be trusted not to kidnap, burn barns, put out false documents. So there have been real problems with security in this country, and I do wish there was a little more uh, debate and discussion about that in, in the current context um, just to do that. But I think the time has come when we have to now raise the Charlie Hebdo, uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, affair because it's uh, it still haunts the media. It haunts our discussion. It's in a discussion where a lot of people were um, stunned by the beginning of the crisis that this was taking place a shooting in a cartoon cartoonist office, and then uh, it was the big the great march, Je suis Charlie through Paris, one of the great public demonstrations I've ever witnessed, uh, at least on television. And then we have the debate that editors had to face, do we reprint, do we republic? And that debate is still going on all around the media. We're still having it. It's with us now. I'm going to ask you, to Natasha, to weigh in first because I know it's going to be tough. I, to me, I did not think there would be as much of a debate because the argument presented by many editors who chose not to print the cartoons was that well, we didn't print the cartoons prior to the attack, so why would we change our policies now? Well, our policies change all the time, and they change depending on the variables surrounding that decision. So something very big has happened in the world where people lost their lives, presumably over the creation of those cartoons. So that changes the rules of engagement for how we or why we would print those cartoons. Um, the other argument that's presented is that, well, it's offensive to Muslims. And... To me, that is the most 
dismissive and irrational response because what Muslims did you speak to to come to that decision? What, did anyone at the Globe and Mail or CBC have a town council? Were members of the Muslim community consulted? Or did the one Muslim in your newsroom uh, tell you, well, it might not be a good idea? Or did you, were you afraid? And I mean, don't, I really am concerned about what is actually fear of reprisal being covered up is we're trying to be sensitive. Because you're also, if you're saying you're trying to be sensitive, you're accepting a very limited narrative of what it means to be a Muslim. So yes, overwhelmingly Muslims surveyed will say they find any depiction of the Prophet offensive and they would prefer for there to not be any physical depiction. But that is also a result of a type of Islam that has become the dominant Islam. So this notion that there's never been any images of Prophet Muhammad is absolutely false. There have, historically in Iran, they've always created images of the Prophet, beautiful images that are published, they are paintings, they are carvings. So then they get dismissed, well, they're Shias, they're not real Muslims. Okay, so then let's move to Turkey. They're Sunnis and they create beautiful depictions and always have for as long as Islam has been in Turkey of of the Prophet. Well, those guys are more European, they're not really Muslims. Okay, then let's move to India with the Mughal Empire where there is a rich history of depictions of the Prophet Muhammad. And people skirt around it too because sometimes his face is veiled, but it's not obscured. You can still see a human face in those images. You can see his face covered in flames, but you can still see the face of a man. Also, in Islamic texts, Nowhere in the Quran and nowhere in the Hadith, which is the practices of the Prophet that many Sunni Muslims use as their guidelines where, to fill in the blanks where they feel the Quran is not uh, a complete document. In neither of those two Islamic pieces of literature does it say anywhere that you cannot depict the Prophet. So when someone tells you, and this, is, this goes back to the journalism of the thing, of challenging it, when you're saying, why aren't we doing better analysis about these bills coming out on security? Why are we not, as journalists, doing better analysis of these, what I would describe as bogus arguments, irresponsible arguments, and say, well, that's not my understanding. I, I've tried to study the Quran. I've tried to study the Hadith. This is a very small group's interpretation, and they have spread it throughout the world, and it's irresponsible for journalists whose job is to question any illogic to accept it. I, I just, I, I can't believe it. And as I said to you guys, at, sorry, at the offset, I find it offensive as a Muslim. This will get me in trouble, I'm sure, at work. But it, this is racism of different rules for different people. This is a type of racism. If you feel that, well, we can depict uh, Jewish prophets and Christian prophets in a, in, a, in a mocking way because we know they won't retaliate. But those crazy Muslims, they can't be trusted. They're going to kill somebody. They're going to shoot somebody. So we've got to have different rules for them. Either we're all equal or we're not equal. But we, have to, we can't have different rules for different people. And, and I feel very strongly about that. Either we are all equal citizens in these countries or we're not. My instinct as a journalist would have been to run them. Uh, the images, as, as was the case with the uh, Copenhagen uh, blasphemous cartoons that caused a scandal. Um, partly because that's my taste, and uh, uh, both practically I like to run the evidence of the thing we're writing about. I also like to run provocative and offensive things. Uh, I'm a bit tabloidy that way. And, uh, and, and also it was a gesture of solidarity for the people who were who were killed, and 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 uh, and also I'm a fairly anti-religious person, and I, I like offending religious people. Um, that said, I don't think it was a big matter of principle to run it or not. And I think it was a bit of a false debate that, that this was the hill that we were all going to die on uh, as to whether we published these cartoons or not. I think there were. Plenty of reasons why publications or, or television broadcasters would not publish them that had nothing to do with cowardice and so on, although I certainly did hear people saying things about, oh, we don't want to offend this community or we, we don't want our staff to be in danger. Your staff's not going to be in danger. Uh, you're not going to lose readers. You're, not going, to, you're not, not going to have the Muslims on your staff quit over this. But there were other reasons why people wouldn't run them. The practicality reason, which is that 
Uh, these are images that, that were very much embedded in particular contexts of politics in France that are almost incomprehensible outside. Uh, the context reason, in the sense that, yes, this was an attack against a satirical newspaper for the first couple days, and then it also became an attack on Jews in a very profound and disturbing way. And do we really want to be saying that this is, this is mainly uh, about freedom of speech and not about anti-Semitism and, and uh, uh, violence against a religious minority? Um, uh, there, so there were, there, were, there, were, there were legitimate reasons why you might not want to print them. My instinct would have been to do so uh, and, and go by that, but I really, I think this was a, a false and misleading debate uh, that I do it. It has to do with different approaches to, journal, to running a newspaper and editing a newspaper or a television station or so on. The, the sort of engaged way that I like to do it, with, with where, where, where if somebody's controversial, you bring them in specifically because you're controversial and you hang the controversy out there and let your freak flag, flag fry, fly and so on, um, uh, is not the only method of journalism. There's a, there's a more uh, sort of removed approach to journalism where, where you stand at a distance from the things and that so on. Not, not everybody who chronicles the events of the day has to be an activist engaged in the events of the day. So I think, there's, I think, I think we need to move beyond this idea that, that we all have to practice journalism the same way. I, I have to respond to that because... Can I throw in a it, comment in first? And then you respond to both? Because um, just quickly say, I'm still on the rack of anguish myself from the sordid Otis. I listen to voices I res greatly respect on, on both sides of the debate. I just wanted to throw in a, a quote from Tony Berman, a highly respected journalist, former head of CBC News, former head of Al Jazeera, who uh, wrote a column saying he applauded the editors who had the courage not to run not to rerun, not to reprint, and commented, we felt we could easily describe the drawings in simple and clear English without actually showing them. Why should we insult and upset an important part of our audience for absolutely no public value? We wouldn't have done that if it involved over examples of racism or anti-Semitism or libel. I do share the view of many of today's news executives who believe that gratuitously demeaning religious beliefs to create a commotion is too easy and too pointless to justify. So that's another strong view that is there. It is there in journalism, and I know you want to contest that. Well, I do because... It it's not a sideshow for me if I'm a TV reporter. In any other TV story I would do, as much as I can use visuals to illustrate the point of the story, I would need those visuals. So if I've got two men who claim allegiance to Al-Qaeda and a third guy who's claiming allegiance to ISIS, and both those organizations have said the depictions of the Prophet Muhammad are absolutely unacceptable, and in the past this same magazine has come under threat of assault and also been sued for depictions of the prophet, I need to show the audience the story. They can make up their own decision, but in any other story I was telling, if there was a visual that would support the narrative and that would help people understand what I'm talking about, I shouldn't have to describe it as a TV reporter. I've got the picture to show you. I should be allowed to show it. It was said earlier in one of the sessions that, that maybe this is not really a question of freedom of press, but of civility. There's also a civility bar. At what point do we look at ourselves and say, look, Charlie Hebdo, British Private Eye, Canadian Frank magazine, if anybody can remember that, were magazines that were, let's face it, scurrilous, but also had strong veins of sadism that ran through their humor, their attacks on people. Do we really want to risk the great social upheavals, and I tell you, I'm still undecided in the rack of anguish. Do we want to risk that when what we're defending are cartoons which undeniably do hurt tens and tens of thousands of people? I think, um, I mean, first of all, in, in normal times, we wouldn't have run their cartoons, not not because of sort of prudish taste, but because they, they, they are from... Uh, from a weird sort of place. There, I mean, it was a hippie magazine. It was founded out of out of May '68 in Paris by by the left wingers who marched during during that. were anti-authoritarian authoritarian in every way, um, 
and I, quite, I, I mean, I had visited them and had, had and in, in enjoyed the company of the Charlie Hebdo guys, and you know, watched them do their cartooning and so on. And uh, uh, but it was, it was so, it was. Uh, look, the closest thing in English language culture was R. Crumb. Uh, his his comics or the fabulous furry freak brothers or something like that, which we probably wouldn't run because mostly they were women with giant boobs and and uh, and giant bums uh, being portrayed in a in a vision of sexuality that was somewhat outmoded, and so on and it, and it, a type of uh, libertine politics that is regarded as sort of self evident nowadays. That said, if somebody had gone and killed R. Crumb, uh, we would have been running his his most sexist images all over the cover and, and that sort of thing. Um, and there are some double standards. I mean, the French police did not help anybody when after it, all of France and Europe and much of the rest of the world went to Paris to have a march in support of freedom of expression and support of the right to run offensive images, images that may offend religious minorities and that sort of thing. The next week they locked up a really grotesque uh, Muslim comic for making anti-Semitic jokes and so on. Well. On a certain level, if you're going to allow people to be offensive, you have to allow everybody to be offensive. It's the same. It's the same thing. I mean, if you're going to say there's there's no such thing as hate speech, which I agree there should be no such thing as hate hate speech, then you have to be willing to suffer the consequences of that, which is that there's going to be a lot of stuff out there that you are supporting, and I'm willing to support, uh, or at least tolerate its existence in the world and argue against it, uh, that you find abhorrent. And I think I think it starts falling apart very quickly as as soon as as soon as that becomes a thing. I think it would have been a nice symbolic gesture though to run those cartoons. And for TV, it's very very awkward to not show that. There was a crazy moment on one of the British TV networks where they were interviewing somebody who was a, who was a respected person who, in answer to questions, said, "Oh, here here's the cover of the the Charlie Hebdo. You can see that." And they immediately the cut camera away. panned up yeah. and and okay. cut away to the brought, the newscaster who said, "I'd apologize for what you just saw there." That sort of thing. It, that was. It was ludicrous. Uh, as, as you say, actually chronicling something yeah. day to day uh, as as news on camera, it starts to feel a little bit like a very awkward form of self. I mean, it's very different from printing something in a newspaper as a statement of solidarity to, to showing what the thing is everybody's yelling about on TV. Well, you know, to go back to this thing, I, I think it has to be a case-by-case -case basis. No, you certainly wouldn't show images, I think, in order to tell the story, I don't need to show the most vile images created by Charlie Hebdo of the prophet. But I need to show one image, for sure. You, I think we needed to show this is an example of what some people are offended by and could potentially be the reason why uh, those men carried out those attacks. There, and you disclose that there are images that were far more vile. We made a decision to not publish those. But then this perfect example, I'm glad you brought it up, I think it was Sky News or something, um, where the woman who is an analyst and she has the latest copy of the Charlie Hebdo that has the prophet on the cover saying everything is forgiven. It's actually probably the most thoughtful depiction of the prophet that Charlie Hebdo has ever created. I thought it was a brilliant cover. I went to great lengths across several countries to try and get a copy of it um, because I think it meant so much to those of us who care about freedom of the press. But the response from the journalist was so bizarre for the camera to pan up and this fear in her that oh my goodness, if you've been offended what you did not, from what you almost saw and what you clearly did not see, I'm so deeply sorry. What is this sense of having to protect people from, from a, a vision? I, I, just, I, I found it absolutely bizarre, and we've gone way over into the deep end of trying to protect people's feelings. That's not our job. We have a social responsibility to behave ethically, to behave responsibly, but to hurt people's feelings about potentially seeing a cartoon that is so mild and gentle and almost affectionate. I mean, there, 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 I think there was one element in some outlets that they had, um, aside from being a little overly sensitive about offending communities, which to the point that being that sensitive is going to offend possibly more people in those communities than not being sensitive, is that there were legal departments that were oversensitive as well. I can think of one outlet whose legal counsel said to them, oh, no, you'd be liable for putting the staff at danger. You can't run this, which is, I have to say is not a good media. A good, a good media legal counsel, a good libel lawyer uh, or, or legal counsel is not someone who says, no, this is too dangerous. You can't do this. It's someone who says, here's how you can get away with doing this. Right? <laughs> That's what you want your lawyer to say. The interesting point mentioned there that um, in being too sensitive 
towards some communities, we start to offend those communities who feel they can't be dealt with honestly. And I think this has been raised as one of the arguments uh, along the lines of something's gone wrong with multiculturalism, or we don't understand multiculturalism as much anymore. We're not dealing with it the way it was designed when uh, I think the original Green Paper Bill 75 came in back in the, the, the 70s. Uh, is there an element here where we begin to exclude people or give people a sense they're kind of being excluded from the mainstream of society because they only talk about us in very uh, neutral or mamby pamby terms that is this a problem with minorities that they feel we're we're be not we're not included because we're not really treated like anyone else in the media not that we're treated badly it's that we're barely treated at all well i think the case with the muslim community in all over the West is very specific to the Muslims. So you can't, you know, you can't lump in the Hindus and Sikhs and other people of color into this. This is a very Muslim-specific discussion. And I do think there is a premise of going into any conversation when it involves Muslims, no matter what the story is, is assuming that the Muslims are the victims. Um, and that's problematic. That's lower expectations for an entire community of a billion people on this planet, which does not allow you to tell the story responsibly. And it it clouds you. If the whole premise is to not have bias, most of us are going into our stories with a great deal of bias. So that makes this uh, that makes telling the story honestly problematic. The other issue, which I mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, is well, who represents the communities, right? So overwhelmingly, you have people who work with Islamic institutions or organizations, people who represent mosques, and when the vast majority of Muslims in Canada and in the West are not attending mosques, so why is an imam speaking on our behalf? It's very hard. Yeah, you left. You feel left out because if the, there's this massive vacuum of space where analysis has to be thrown in and perspective has to be given, and that vacuum is fill, filled by conservative imams or people who are hostile to the West, when sometimes those people are the same, then, yeah, it makes it very difficult because the average Muslim living in France, in UK, in Canada, in the United States feels their voice cannot be represented. And there is a fear. That cannot be um, underplayed. There is a fear of Muslims who are moderate, who are not overly religious, who do not sympathize in any capacity with ISIS or Al-Qaeda, to say, I kind of support the security bill. I, I think our community is going too far. It's, they are afraid to say we have a problem. Physically afraid is I think morally so. afraid. Yeah. I think, uh, I think you, it's a good point there. I think one of the reasons why people say, oh, how can the conservatives be passing that kind of uh, a, a security bill when it's the same party that's trying to get religious minorities and, and visible minorities to, to be supportive. I mean, it's got, the conservatives have done more than any Canadian political party uh, in the last 20 or 30 years to try to get uh, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh communities to be loyal voters for their party. Uh, how could they do that? And I think you're quite right in saying, well, a large part of it is that members of Muslim communities support tough on crime bills. They are hugely threatened by this political threat in their midst. I don't. I. I. I don't know a lot of uh, uh, you know Lebanese or Pakistani uh, parents in around me who aren't afraid of the idea of their kids getting hooked into some sort of Salafist movement or or some kind of jihadi ideas or something. This idea of your kids uh, being tempted to go to Syria or something is 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 a, is a deeply tangible worry. Uh, for these fa families, to the fa fa point that I think it's created a, a real polarization in, 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 in that there's a real desire to support things that'll be tough on that. On the other hand, there's this, there's this sense that this is also uh, uh, being perpetuated by various people who are, who, are, who are also backing judges who won't allow people to wear headscarves into court and, 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 and all this sort of thing. I think, I think maybe this is, a, this is, this is where the concept of multiculturalism I mean, versus other forms of pluralism runs into a, a really difficult journalistic wall in that we've been used to conceiving of the idea of the diversity of Canada, not in terms of, of 
plural identities or in terms of diversity, but in terms of multiculturalism in this idea that there are fixed and monolithic cultures mm -hmm. that sit next to each other in Canada. There are the Muslims, mm -hmm. there are the Sikhs, yeah. there are the First Nations, uh, and and that the, that the that in as a journalist you're walking out and trying to open the door to a culture, talk to the first person you find out, and that's the culture there. Um, I think most Canadian, and I've, as I've said, I think the, the point where multiculturalism starts to fail is in the second generation, where people want to have more multi and less culturalism, uh, and that it starts to limit diversity in that within, within any of these supposedly monolithic cultures, there is in fact huge contradiction in diversity and 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 probably majorities of people who would rather not be identified primarily by their cultural, I mean, lots of, I mean, uh, I don't know a lot of people who are Muslim uh, who would like that to be the main thing about them, right? Who, uh, people running certain organizations maybe, but beyond that, I don't know many people who are Jewish who would like to be mainly the Jew, you know? I don't, I don't, I think, I think that's a fairly universal feeling. And that, the problem with that multicultural conception of the reality out there when practiced by journalists is that we tend to reify these, these rigid cultural walls. We have only about a minute left. Oh, time is up already. I got 10 seconds only. We heard earlier historians say it's very hard not to be pessimistic these days. How do journalists feel, those of you that are on the front line of covering news, do you feel the same? 10 seconds only. Oof. Uh, personally, it's, it, it's a tough battle going into this, covering these stories, but I'm not pessimistic because it's going to sound so arrogant, but I trust myself, and I feel tremendous sense of responsibility when it comes to these stories and I feel I can tell them fairly and honestly and I feel the CBC and Canadian media for the most part wants to get it right and they want to do it well. Five seconds, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Doug. I, I, th I think we're going through a rough patch. Um, we do need to remember that we've been through this before, uh, that uh, two generations ago if you'd been sitting at this corner you may have well have heard somebody talking saying that the, the Catholics coming from Southern Europe were part of a plot to take over the country. Uh, and there was enough violence out there and fascism in their countries to convince you that that was true. So we, 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 need, we need to have some... His, I think I, I wish the historians panel had gone on longer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.